right, real quickly, last week I talked about the isms, rationalism, intuitionism, ex uh, experiencism, uh, experiencism, uh, empiricism, thank you, thank you, scientism, all these isms that try to be an ultimate starting point. How do you know this? Well, reason tells me, or I only believe what science can tell me. These are all ultimate starting points that the world uh, will give to you. Uh, again, they ultimately fall short, right, because they can't account for all knowledge of all places of all times and of all possibilities and of all possible relationships of things in relation to each other. So there's always going to be skepticism that comes in relation to those. And they are ultimately circular in their, in their argument about why they should be the ultimate starting point. Why should reason be the ultimate starting point? Well, reason tells me that reason should be the ultimate starting point. Okay, so every, every ultimate starting point is circular in its reasoning, okay, uh, in that. So here's, here's what I want to say for that, though. The point is, though, when the world builds uh, their ultimate epistemology or how they know what they know on an ism, rationalism, empiricism, intuitionism, whatever it is, the point is they're setting that on a creation fa uh, framework. I mean, we talked about the CFR, creation, fall, redemption. Well, for us, we're, out, we're talking about literal creation, that God made things the way they are. But when you adopt an evolutionary framework as your basis of reality, when you set rationalism on that, how can you account for consistent laws of rationalism when everything is in a state of flux? See, for the fact that they want to use rationalism and laws of logic and so forth and or laws of science and then assume that they're going to be consistent like they were yesterday, it's a blind leap of faith for them. Okay, so my point on that, uh, down under D, number two, when they base their starting point on, on an evolu evolutionary framework, it's quicksand. Evolution is in a state of flux of change. How can you get laws of logic, consistent forms of reasoning, experience, etc., from an evolutionary framework? Yet they operate as if these things are normative, fixed, regular things. Now, why do they do that? Because they're doing two things here. They're seeking to suppress the truth of God, but also they have to live with the truth of God. Why? Because this is God's world, and they have to live in it. They can't operate otherwise. But that's an inconsistency, and that's where you need to call their hand uh, on that. Okay? All right, real quick, I'm going to go through Kokel's book here. If you don't have that book, Tactics, it's a great book to, to have on dealing with some basic questions. I always ask people when they make statements, how do you know that? How do you know that? Okay? Why do you think that way? Can you explain further what you mean? What do you mean by that? And this is, again, where we talked about the importance of definitions because they may not mean what you think they mean by that. So always ask for clarification. Make them be able to articulate their position. Says who, right? That's what every debate comes down to that. Either God says or man says. That's, that's every debate uh, in that. So what you'll find is unbelievers make claims, but Christians let them get away with it. Like, if you're going to make a claim, you're going to have to back it up by something. You're going to have to give me proofs or reasons about why you say this. Don't let unbelievers get away with that. So lead the way for them. Uh, often their objections are not thought through. I just think the Bible is just full of errors. Well, let's, let's talk about those errors. What, which ones are you seeing? What do you think? Uh, why do you think there's errors? Uh, which ones do you think specifically are errors? And I've asked unbelievers that before. They just said, well, it's just been corrupted. And then they just keep making statements. I'm like, well, okay, I've heard you. You've said it's corrupted, but like, where is it corrupted? Well, it's just, you know, over time it's just, it's just not the same as it was in the beginning. Like, okay, you're still saying the same thing you just said a while ago. Like, give me proof of this. Show me where uh, and what you're talking about, okay? And you'll find that. I've said this before. Unbelievers have a lot more bark than they do bite. And a lot of Christians are afraid uh, to engage a lot because they make these audacious claims, and Christians are afraid to, to take them head on with that. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the telephone. Yeah, the, the, the illustration of the telephone game is a popular idea that the Bible has been corrupted because they say, uh, they try to say that the scriptures were not written at least, you know, 50, 60, 80 years after the events happened. Actually, that's, those dates are probably too far out, you know. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can go with that. First of all, uh, he doesn't understand a auditory culture. Now, we're a visual culture in the sense that we write things down, they're encoded, 
I mean, there's hardly anything done today that's not written down. But in auditory culture, uh, there was a lot of mnemonic devices, and you can find some of these in the Gospels and in some of the writings about how, how the, the structures or the passages and so forth are laid out so they're easily memorized. Uh, I forget what psalm it is. Is it Psalm 119, the longest psalm? It starts with every A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so to speak, of the Hebrew alphabets to, to memorize that. So, and not only that, there's a huge community there to keep it from being corrupted uh, in that. I mean, Luke tells you, uh, I would take you to the Gospel of Luke. Luke says, well, look, he looked in historical documents. We don't know what all he looked at. But he said he researched historical documents to make sure of the accuracy of these things. And then he cross-checked it with other references to make sure it was on cue. And so you have to re remember that if you came out and presented anything in the early church that was contrary to what they knew, they'd been all over it and said, no, you're wrong on this. Because they were seeking to hold the testimony of Christ real true. And the passage in Corinthians 15 where Paul says, it's the kata something, I forget exactly the, the Hebrew there, but it says and that Christ died for our scriptures and that uh, uh, that he was raised and that he was buried according to the scriptures. That whole phrase there is an early uh, uh, hymn or early doctrinal creed that was incorporated that Paul used. And there's some studies behind that to show that. But it dates back within about seven years of the crucifixion and resurrection. It, it dates back, that part of Corinthians dates back that early. Well, some of them, the Psalms, they would have. But, mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was, it wasn't just like Jesus told one person, right? He told thousands of people this. And so there was all kinds of accountability around them. You know, if they came in preaching, Jesus said this in the middle of the town, they'd say, nope, no, he didn't ever say that. Yeah, the problem is, is there's just no evidence for that. I mean, just you look at all the manuscripts and they're all the same. You know, I mean, you're going to find a letter difference here and there because some copyist made a mistake, but you're going to find Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd in that manuscript, and then if you go 300 miles away and find another manuscript, it's going to say, The Lord is my shepherd. It's, it's going to be the same thing. So, but uh, well, let me, we'll talk more about this after class. But okay, that's, you're good. But hey, here's something I've seen within, in leading the way with unbelievers. Keep them on task. What I've found in engaging our, our unbeliever friends is that they want to throw 100 issues at it. Well, the Bible's been corrupted. Well, how do you know that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, what about the Old Testament? And then what about they want to throw a pile it on you? And what you need to say is like, hey, what? You know what? Let's have an intelligent conversation about this. Let's talk about one issue at a time, okay? So you, you mentioned this first. Let's talk about that. So I'm going to let you ask me a question, but then I'm going to ask you a question, okay? Let's do that. One, one question, one answer. One question, one answer. And keep them on task because a lot of times unbelievers will try to talk all around an issue and say, yeah, I understand that's a concern, and, you, and you have, you're going to have a tendency to want to answer that, but say, but this is kind of what we were talking about. Let's come back and let's talk about this one thing here, okay? So try to keep them on uh, task. Take the roof off. Take them to their logical, absurd conclusions of their worldviews. All, all ethics are relative. You know, if they say things like that, well, let's see where that goes, okay? Just take their position and run into its logical end, which they will not do majority of the times. Uh, saw the branch off you're sitting on. It's a self-defeating statement, basically, and we've talked about some of these before. Uh, but number four under E, you're just a Christian because of where you grew up. And I said to an atheist who said that to me before, I said, well, that's fine. I said, but remember that sword cuts two ways. I said, you're just an atheist because of where you grew up. No, I've thought through my position. Oh, okay, so you've been objective and I'm not, you know, uh, in that. But you'll see a majority of people's claims fall under their own weight. So when you keep asking why is that true, you're actually trying to get down to the core assumptions or presuppositions that they hold. And that's where you want the debate to take place, okay? Because that's where you're going to win the argument, okay? So last thing I'll say on this, and I'm going to let Craig be, be coming on up here, is don't, don't always think that you've always got to be on the defensive as a Christian. Questions like this will turn the issue back. If you're going to make a statement, you're going to have to defend it. We're not going to go all over the place. We're going to deal with one thing at a time and see if your worldview can hold up under the weight of it and take account of it. Okay. All right, this time Craig's going to come up and uh, talk to us about the Trinity. Um, very briefly, uh, if you want to know a good book on the Trinity to read, there are a lot of good books out. Uh, this is by Robert Leesham. It's put out by PR, and uh, I think that's one of the best books on the Trinity. It goes in-depth with um, 
from a historical, theological, and even worshipful doxology of the, of the Trinity. So that's the deep stuff. And then the plain and simple Rose Publisher. This is amazing the information they, they put on this little pamphlet. So this book, I don't know, is going to be uh, just under $20 maybe or thereabout. This is going to be about four uh, bucks. Uh, so uh, tonight the lecture will be between these two. It's <laughs> a little bit closer to this. But this is amazingly thorough. Uh, it hits all the major points there on the Trinity. Uh, why don't I choose on the Trinity tonight? And please bear with me uh, because of the weather and all. We're having to crunch in two lessons in, in one night. So um, we're a couple of minutes over. We'll try not to, but uh, uh, be patient with us on this. All right, why the Trinity? Well, uh, there's a lot of reasons why. And let me just uh, pop this up. If you have the, uh, the outline for tonight, what I did, I made the outline as basic as I could. And the only part I want you to do tonight, really, is the seven points. And I'll give you about 14 because I want you to be able to, after this class is over, for you to go home sometime this week and be able to fill out just from your personal experience what you've learned in class, what you already know, what you know about the Trinity. Now, if you want to do it tonight, that's fine. Okay? So, let's see if I can use this little pointer here. Um, the unity and diversity of God that is referring to the Trinity. Again, why tonight? Because the Trinity is the most important doctrine of the Christian faith. It separates us from everything else. Uh, a basic theological and apologetic study of the Trinity. Um, is it blurry to you? That's blurry. To Uh, so here's the purpose of this study is for you to be able to um, be aware of the importance of the Trinity. You may already be aware of that, but hopefully by the time this is over with, you will have a greater awareness of its importance, okay? Um, there we go. Oh. All right, to state the Trinity, you may, be all, uh, you may already be able to do that, but are you aware of some words that can be problematic, all right? like subordinate. You need to be careful how to use that if you want to use it at all. Um, define the orthodox teaching of the Trinity. I may have put, uh, I think originally I had biblical orthodox Trinity, but that being redundant. Uh, learn terms that are used in referring to the Trinity. I only used about four or five. I wish I'd have used more now, but, uh, but that's okay. You may have some questions there. Uh, I tell you what, too, because of time, if you do uh, have questions, um, try to keep them as few as possible, okay? Uh, only ask if you absolutely need to know, and it would be better to save it at the end. But if you have a question, for clarity's sake, uh, don't hesitate to stop me. And hopefully you'll be able to defend the Trinity much better after this class. And you need to know key texts from Scripture as well. And also, what are the implications of the Trinity? Just in our daily living, this is something that, my pointer work here, this is something that most people don't even think about. <coughs> even theologians, they, historians, they don't even think about that. Okay? And some of the books that are written on the Trinity don't even address that at all. We'll, we'll kind of address that a little bit tonight. I'm going to throw Channing a bone. All right? All righty. I don't know what that's about. I don't know. <laughs> Vertigo. All right. <clears throat> the doctrine of the Trinity is, is an essential belief of the Christian faith. We'll all agree with that. The teaching of the Trinity sets Christians apart from all other religions, sets, and cults of the world. All right. The Trinity is therefore unique to the Christian religion, and by affirming the belief in the Trinity, the Christian is making themselves exclusive separate themselves from all other belief systems out there. Okay? That's important to know that. Now, but belief in the Trinity, does that mean that you're going to heaven when you die? No, it does not. So you can be orthodox in all of your belief and still die and go to hell. I like um, 
what, what the comment that was made earlier. Let me read you a quote. Uh, apologetics by itself has no persuasion. So that goes along with what you said. There is no persuasion in apologetics. The Holy Spirit must work there. If it is persuasion without them coming, and we're talking about Christian apologetics, if there is persuasion and they don't come to know Christ, then is it really persuasion? No, it's, it's turning over a new leaf. It's not, we're talking about conversion in that persuasion. So if, there, if there's persuasion but not conversion, it's not a godly persuasion. In other words, the Holy Spirit's not there. Here's another quote. Nothing, nothing in the Christian faith is or can be divorced from the Word, prayer, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, everything that we do, and in light of apologetics, if you divorce apologetics from the Spirit of God, there's no persuasion. Okay, and that's what we've been saying. That's what we're, what we want to communicate to you. That's important. <laughs> By the way, a bad argument can be persuasive sometimes. Happens all the time. And good arguments can have little persuasion. Now, give me a little slack in using the word persuasion there and, you know, because of what I said previously. But I've heard of an argument. Here, here's one I, I use very briefly. A um, professor who is now with the Lord today shared this with me, that a man who was converted in Alabama was great at evangelism, but he only knew one verse in the Bible. He, he was ignorant of, of God's word in quoting it. He knew... Th stories and whatnot, and he was at this <clears throat> a man's home. He come and knocked on the door, and he knew the man was at home, and the man didn't answer the door. He uh, heard the door slam in the back and the gate latch, and so he runs around back and catches the guy coming out of the gate, and so he's witnessing to this guy, and this guy is a hunter. He likes to hunt. And, but uh, this guy's witnessing to him, and he can't get anywhere with this guy. And he sees this tree, and he, sees, he hears the dogs barking. He says, you know something? <laughs> and he uses something I would never say, so unorthodox. He says, you know, I hear there's a river in heaven, and by that river there may be a tree. And who's to say that there's no hunting in heaven? <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, that, you know, where's, the, where's good, explicit, biblical, orthodox truth in that, you know? That's a poor persuasion. But in that statement and what he had said previously, God used that, and the guy stayed around and listened to him because he loved hunting. And he, the guy was talking about heaven and there being a river and whatnot. And who's to say there's not hunting in heaven? Well, I would never use that. But the point of the matter is you can good... Don't think that your biblical orthodoxy or your pedigree, your training, is going to persuade them. It will not. Now, we do believe that the Spirit is a Spirit of truth, all right? So it's not like the Holy Spirit is going to use complete error or falsehood. Uh, we, we would not go that far. But, uh, but how many of us in here uh, is 100% biblically orthodox and without any need of sanctification in your mind? None of us, okay? And the Holy Spirit still uses you and myself, so. All right. Um, here are some definitions of, of Trinity. Have you had time to look at that? The Trinity is therefore unique. All of these things to the Christian faith. Here's Trinity defined by respected theologians. First and First one comes from a pocket dictionary on theological terms by InterVarsity Press. The second one is bare minimum. That's by Millard Erickson in his little paperback uh, dictionary uh, of theological terms and words. And then the last one is from the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I like the most. Uh, I'll read that one. In the unity of the Godhead, by the way, our uh, London Confession, I believe, is very similar to, th to that. Uh, in the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor preceding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. 
Okay, here are some terms. How many of you ever heard of the economic trinity? You ever heard of the economic trinity? What about the imminent trinity? Matter of fact, the economic trinity is used um, in, in the sense of God's relationship of himself to us. It's what he reveals. It's what we know about the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and what they do and how they act and form. It was the Father sent the Son. How do we know that? Because of the Bible. The Son died on the cross. How do we know that? Because of the Bible and history. Okay? This is the, it wasn't the Father who died on the cross. It was the Son. So th in this way, think of it this way, it's what we witness of the Trinity. Okay? As opposed to the imminent trinity is something we don't know about. We don't witness that because that's something before time, space, or well, it could be right now as well, but it, it's something that God does not reveal to us. It's the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in private. Okay? The imminent trinity, God's knowledge of himself that we have no access to. Okay? that God just doesn't reveal. Uh, what would be a good verse in the Bible to substantiate the imminent trinity? Uh, there's an aspect, I guess you could say, of that. that. Maybe a little bit of both. There's definitely the ec economic trinity because you see the relationship there. Um, there may be an aspect of the imminent trinity. I was thinking of Deuteronomy 29, 29 in the will of God. Something he reveals, something he does not reveal. Uh, what about John 17? Think about that. The glory that the Father and Son had together. W what are you talking about? What glory? <laughs> All right. Now someday, though, that's going to become part of the economic trinity. We're going to take part in that someday. And by the way, if, don't see this as an exercise of the mind. We're talking about God here. This should excite us. There should be a way that this should stir doxology in our heart. It would be a sin for, your, for me to teach this, and I'm not thinking for a moment that I'm sharing things with you that none of you have ever heard of. I know that uh, many of you, if not most of you, have heard much of this already. But it's fun to talk about God and who God is and what he's done, how he reveals himself. And so... Uh, this is not only an exercise of our mind. This is a, a way to stir worship in our hearts to thinking about who God is. Uh, the third term there, it means the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. This belief may have been the chief cause of the split between the Western and Eastern Christendom back in AD 1054. Also, this last one, I need to explain this a little bit. And I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Perichoresis? All right. Peric it must be a Latin term. Perichoresis. A term used by the Cappadocian fathers, referring to the mutual indwelling and fellowship of the persons of the Trinity. It's another way of saying, too. Um, Without mixing them and maintaining their distinction, where the Father is, the Son is. Where the Son is, the Father is. Where the Holy Spirit is, the Father is. You see? But yet there's maintaining oneness and um, <coughs> distinction. Okay? All right. Uh, let's state the Trinity simple before I state and you can look at this as a thought um, well I'm going to withhold that we'll get to that when we get to uh, defending the Trinity the Trinity stated simply is God is one in essence and three in persons now we could say one in being we can say one in substance one in essence all that's synonymous you can say God is three in persons or personages the word person in Greek and Latin does not mean that men what we see as persons today. That's why many people struggle with using the word persons because it, it means like a complete individual separate from others. And uh, you do not want to say that the persons are separate. 
You want to say they're distinct, but don't use the word separate. If you use the word separate, or if you hear a Christian using that, the, uh, the word separate for the persons, ask them, do you mean that they are separate in their essence? And if they say yes, what are they? Polytheist. They're polytheists. That's, that's tritheism. So they may be using the word separate and not being very uh, particular. And if you say, are, you, are they three in being? And they say, no, no, there's only one being. Then they're, okay, well, okay. well they're, they're saying the same thing you are. They should just use the word distinct instead of separate. Um, one in being, one in essence. Well, there is one God, and you see the passages for that. And there are many. The Father is called God, and no one disputes that because over and over and over again there are many, many passages that substantiate that the Father is God. The Son is called God in the Bible as well. In John 1.1 1, 1, and in many other places. The Holy Spirit is called God. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, okay? Who did Ananias lie to? The Holy Spirit. And in the next verse, who is the Holy Spirit? God. Okay? Uh, very quickly, would someone uh, look up 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and read verse 16 and 17? And by the way, the this Trinity is a way of us explaining what is revealed in Scripture. Okay? But because of the language of Scripture, it forces us to this kind of doctrine. It forces us to believe that. Okay? Somebody read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. The Lord and the Spirit are the same. Okay? The Lord and the Spirit are the same there. There are many other passages, and you compare that, this one, with Exodus. Who would like to read Exodus 34, 34? Because that's what uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14 is alluding to. I'm going to read that very quickly. Exodus 34, 34. Do, uh, the scripture does this a lot. It compares. Isaiah does it a lot with the New Testament. When you compare, say, well, here it's talking about God. In the New Testament, it's talking about Jesus. Or like in Acts chapter 28, does the same thing. We, well, here it's talking about the Spirit. But that parallel passage is talking about God in the Old Testament. So the scripture does that a lot. Here's, we're going to take some time out here and do some... Uh, I'm, we're going to participate here, okay? Uh, now, if I had a lot more time, I would just run through all of these. See what? Let me. I, I do want to run through some of them. I'm not going to run through all of them, but I want to run through about three or four, because if you hear all of these, it, it starts getting weighty. If you've never heard it done this way, and here's the argument that people like Jehovah's Witnesses will use, okay? And then we're going to go back and together respond to these arguments. All right? Here's one of the arguments that they use. Um, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. It is a man-made word that, con uh, that continues the tradition fueled by men at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. Okay? They dream this up. Jesus is not God because he was tempted. And the Bible says that God cannot be tempted. This is what James 1.13 says. But yet Jesus is tempted in chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 1. 
these people who do not believe in the Trinity or the deity of Christ, they say that Jesus cannot be God because God is all-knowing. And Jesus did not know when the second coming would take place in Mark 13, 32. Jesus never said he was God. He said that he was only a man. Go back and read 1 Timothy 2, 5. That he was a mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. See, they're pretty witty how they take scripture and twist it. Okay? Okay. Jesus said that there is only one God. This is what we must believe if we are to be saved. He says in John 17, 3, he says that there is only one God. And then Jesus, who was sent by him, this is what is necessary to be believed. Well, we'll go on and on. Let's go back and answer these together. Because I wrote about 14 of them. Actually, Jehovah's Witnesses have about 21 of these arguments. But all of them can be answered under um, about six categories. All right? What would you re how would you respond to this one? That the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Incarnation is not found in the Bible. Okay. What about the Council of Nicaea? How would you respond to that one? <laughs> yeah, but they would agree with that. They would say, yeah. Council. The Didache? And what is pointed out, there's at least six people in, in times in history where people defended the Trinity, even though the word was not used. Um, Theophilus is the first known person to use the word Trinity. Tertullian uh, used it a little after him. So the teaching of the Trinity existed before the Council of Nicaea. Okay? And, and even the word was used before the Council of Nicaea. How Actually, uh, that is the wisest way to approach it. I'm just saying this is an answer, but the really the best way to approach them because they've been indoctrinated, and, uh, um, brainwashed, literally. If you meet one Jehovah's Witnesses, usually you've met all of them as far as what they believe in regard to the Trinity. And every now and then you'll, you'll come across, their apologists may have a different slant on things. Uh, but... Yeah, you say, well, I don't care about history. All I care about is the Bible. And I believe in the Trinity not because of the Council of Nicaea but because, or any council, but because of what the Bible teaches. Okay? Matter of fact, that's always the best approach in dealing with any group is the authority of Scripture. Because ultimately, that is. But if you're talking to people who, who admire history, you can use that and supplement it. Okay? All right. Next one is... Jesus is not God because he was tempted. And the Bible says that God cannot be tempted. James 1.13 says that God does not do evil. It says that God cannot be tempted. Yet Jesus was tempted. How do we answer this? What is your response?
tempted just like we were. To use a Hebrew passage, Jesus was tempted just like we were, yet without sin. That's a different issue. On this, on this particular issue, uh, that's not what we're talking about. Um, nailed it on the head. In the hypostatic union, with most of these questions that come up regarding the Trinity or the person and nature of Christ, there is a confusion or misunderstanding of who God is and who Jesus is. Is. It is true that there are some little nuanced differences in place, but that uh, here, that doesn't answer the, well, in some cases it may even create a bigger confusion. The, the answer to this issue is the hypostatic union with Christ. As a man, he can thirst. As a man, he can bleed. As a man, he can die. But as God, he cannot die. He does not thirst. He is immutable. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But yet, in his humanity, that would not apply because he's not the same. He weighed this much, uh, you know, a week before, and then a week later, he weighed less. He weighed more before his crucifixion. He weighed less during his crucifixion. He lost a lot of blood and this sort of thing. Right. Put that, let me simplify that term. What he's saying is, is that in the person of Christ with his two natures, you do not mix them. If you mix them, you have a hybrid. That's wrong. But in the nature of Christ, you do not want to separate them. Nestorius, although he may not have done that, it may have been more of his followers. However, he gets the credit for it. You don't, if you just separate them, then you almost have two natures and two persons. Okay? So you want to keep them together without separation and without mixture. Okay? Uh, the kenosis theories uh, are problematic for me. This is a better explanation, although there are some forms of it uh, that, that may be uh, worth mm, looking into, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't like them for the most part. Jesus took on human nature. He did not lose his deity in any way. That's the, that's the basis of uh, uh, Philippians 2. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. We're going to get to that one. And as a matter of fact, yeah. I right, look at it this way too, and I, at this point too, Wayne Grudem is helpful, and he explains the temptation this way. You can imagine um, 
in my prime, I could press <coughs> over 300 pounds, okay? So you put 1,000 pounds on the bar, and as far as, well, let's put a, a 2,000 pounds. As far as I know, no one has ever been pressed 2,000 pounds. That would crush every, every man. Never okay. hit me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and we get on that, we can't even budget, you know. And uh, so we can't budget. But Jesus gets under, and, or, or a man gets under, and he, he lifts the weight. Now, all of us have felt the pressure and the weight of that 2,000 pounds. And, and we could not succumb it or overcome it. Jesus is like that with sin. He felt the full weight of sin. He just held it up. We couldn't. So temptation works that same way in that he was tempted like us. He did, did not succumb like the first Adam who was sinless even in his nature. Us guilty in our nature. but So I, I think, um, you know, read Wayne Groom in his systematic theology, and I, the illustration he gives with temptation there. I think it's good. Uh, that Therefore, Jesus... Matter of fact, he feels the temptation more than I do. Think of the man who bench presses the 2,000 pounds. I can only do, you know, I, I'm under 350, so I can only feel 350 of that 2,000 pounds of weight. But the man who gets under it and does the 2,000 pounds, he's felt the full weight of that and overcame it. You see? So really, Jesus is more tempted or has experienced and succumbed to more temptation than I ever will. Overcame. overcome. Yeah, overcome. You understand what I'm saying. Uh, he's overcome temptation. And not only that, he was tempted in ways. He was tempted in ways that I am and beyond. I'm not tempted in ways that he is. I've never been tempted to turn a uh, rock to bread. So I don't think anyone else has. I, I don't understand what you're saying. Because one of the things you said in the Yes. Yeah. He felt the weight of temptation. Think of temptation as a weight. And he felt the weight of it. And But not only that, he felt the weight of it more than we could because he had full understanding of its implications. I mean, so then he was tempted. The problem is where he was tempted was in the first place. But if there was a second and two passages, you're saying since God came to tempt him, what we need for the God to help us out of the box. And then his humanity, he can be tempted. In his hypostatic union, he is tempted. In his deity, he is not tempted. And there's no contradiction there. Okay? There would only be a contradiction if we said uh, Jesus in his full person and, and uh, in his person and his humanity and deity were tempted. That would be a contradiction. Next, let's move to the next one. Jesus cannot be God because God is all-knowing and Jesus did not know the future. How would you answer this one? Same way, through the hypostatic union, by knowing who Jesus is. Matter of fact, here we have some paradoxes in Scripture, right? Because in some places Jesus knows. And there's no way that you can know what He knows unless He's God. He knows the hearts of men and He knows... Where to, you know, you, you go, hey, Peter, go fishing and you'll find a coin in a fish's mouth. Yeah. I'm sorry, you don't, you don't know stuff like that. I've tried that at work. Yeah. So, all right. All right, you'll, ca- you'll get the, you'll catch this and, um, and we'll go through this quickly. Jesus said that, uh, he never said he was God. Somebody read 1 Timothy 2 5. And now there are other passages as well. 1 Timothy 2 5. Now, a Jehovah's Witness and some other people will say, see there, G- even Paul knows that Jesus is not God. And they will say, see there, this is God. Jesus is only a mediator. He's only a man. And then they may flip over to uh, John chapter 17 and read verse 3. This is eternal life. Matter of fact, they'll say, you can't even have eternal life if you believe that Jesus is God. 
Because this is what Jesus says himself, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. God sent Jesus. Jesus is not God. And see, with that kind of reasoning and, and rhetoric for a young Christian is confusing. It's confusing for a young believer. And so they don't understand uh, it's good for them to be taught hermeneutics and how to... Matter of fact, these guys can be refuted if you just read a few verses before or a few verses afterwards, okay? And is refuted in this, in this chapter the same way. But again, the hypostatic union answers this and the text itself, if you read before and after, because he's saying the glory that we had together. And in the book of John, and you back up just a, a few chapters, he said, I and the Father are one. And Mormons will say, yeah, but he meant only one in purpose. No, it's one in purpose and one in essence there. It's, yeah, he was one in purpose with the Father, but also one in essence. It's quickly moving on. Jesus said that there is only one God. We really addressed that already. Jesus cannot be God because he's less than God. He's less than God. Someone read John 14, 48. I'm sorry, uh, John 14, 28. I'll do it. You heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. See there? Jesus is less than the Father. He's not greater than the Father. As a matter of fact, he's even less than the angels. Hebrews chapter 2 says that he's less than the angels. So he's less than God and he's less than the angels. Why? Because he's only a man. Now that's powerful rhetoric to a young Christian who doesn't know Scripture very well. But what's the answer to this and other, those other Scriptures? That, that helps, and the hypostatic union. Again, yeah, Jesus as a man does not know the second coming. As Jesus as a man can hunger and thirst, and that is less than God. Because he can die. And he's less than angels in that sense. But guess what? The passage they use in Hebrews chapter 2, back up to Hebrews chapter 1. And what do the angels do? They worship God. And even God the Father calls a son God. Angels don't worship angels. Go to Jude. And Michael says, the Lord rebuke you. <laughs> you know? uh, so, anyway. Jesus is subject to God. Someone read 1 Corinthians 15, 28. He says, see, he's less than God. And when you, when you hear all of these all together, it, it is... It is, it is hard for a young believer uh, to know how to respond to this if they haven't heard them or been trained. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Jesus is subject to God or subordinate to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. you answer that? Again, the economic trinity can answer that. Well, the Father's role is this, the Son's role is this, and the Holy Spirit's role is this. But also, in uh, connection to that, it also the hypostatic union. All right? Now some, it may not be as clear in some cases, but the economic trinity. You know, what's the purpose? Not only that, if we say, if we argue here, well, this proves that the Son is inferior to the Father, then we would have to say, then we believe that women are inferior to men. You know the passage I'm thinking about? That women must submit, women must submit to men, or, or wives must submit to their husbands. Not because husbands are superior. Just as Christ is head over the church, man is head over the family, his wife. That doesn't mean that Christ is... Uh, ontologically subordinate to the Father, but he is submissive to the Father in his person. Okay? 
And if you want to use the word subordinate to the Father in an uh, in his person, but not in his eternal, uh, in eternal or being or essence, that's okay. It's just a little scary when you use the word uh, because of the heresy of subordinationism. Um, all right, next one. Jesus is not eternal like God uh, is because he has a beginning. And they use the Colossians 1.15 that he is what? The first born. You've heard this one. And then they go to Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22, and, and going to a passage, there is a little bit of controversy here, agreed with Christians. Some Christians believe that uh, Ro, uh, excuse me, Proverbs 8 is referring to Jesus. I don't. I think it's, person, it's a personification of wisdom. Okay? Y'all with me on that? You don't have to be. We can disagree on that. But I, I think Proverbs 8 is, is a personification of wisdom. All right. Some things might apply to Jesus, but they go to that and they use that because it seems that there is a beginning there. Uh, how, how do you interpret the firstborn? Okay. Basically, he was heir. Firstborn, it means heir of all things. And because Jesus is the Son of God, by simply because of his rank, he is heir of all creation. Okay, firstborn can mean uh, preeminence. Now, if 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 uh, at this point say, well, you know, if I if I hold to what you believe that he is Jehovah's first creation, and when I go on and read the passage, it doesn't make sense. Because it says that he created all things. And that nothing was created that was not created by him. When you read John 1, 3 with that and Colossians 1, 15 and following. So even if I assume your interpretation is right, it contradicts what Paul says later. So that can't be the meaning of the word firstborn. Okay? So it means preeminent or first place or heir of all things. Okay? No, no, not, no, does not mean that there. I was saying that passage, it just says he's the first one. But then we know he continued as far as chronologically. Mm -hmm. Not in superior order. Right. <laughs> right theology, wrong place. And other places, Paul uses that firstborn in the sense that other people have died, who are like Lazarus and others, Jairus. But Jesus is firstborn, as Paul uses in Corinthians. Now you uh, first fruits, in in that sense, that would be the right way to use it. In that we will be modeled after him, and that Jesus is the first one born or the first fruit that we will be modeled after him, and he will never die again. But he remains human, fully fully God, fully man. But there in Colossians, it, it would not be viewed that way. And we get to the first begotten in one of these passages here. Um, I, think I, we, we, I think I bring that up in one of these. Uh, the Trinity is confusing because God is not the author of confusion. You read 1 Corinthians 14, 33. It says God is not the author of confusion. And the Trinity is very confusing. <laughs> it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all of the churches of the saints. And the Trinity is confusing. Therefore, the Trinity is not biblical. How would we respond to that? Well, number one, don't confuse the word confusing with the word mystery. The Trinity is not confusing. It is very basic and simple. The Bible clearly says, there is one God over and over. That's not confusing. And the Bible clearly says the Father is God. The passages are there. The Bible clearly says the Son is God. The passages are clearly there. 
the Bible clearly says the Spirit is God. Now what is mysterious is how the three can be one. That's not confusing. It's mysterious. Now, some uh, philosopher might say, well, that's contradictory. No, it's not. How is it not contradictory? Because we're not saying that the three persons are one person. We're not th saying that the, the one uh, God are three gods. We're saying that God is one in essence, three in person. And essence and persons are not the same thing. If essence and person were the same thing, that would be a contradiction. But as theologians have spoken in history, we have a subsistence um, to where you have the, a God existing in essence in, in one uh, form, and yet, and I'm, I'm using the word uh, qualitatively or uh, um, in a qualified sense, He's uh, manifesting himself three in person. Now, we, st we don't buy into modalism because he is three persons for all eternity, coexistent and co-equal. Okay? So uh, just because a person may use the word manifestations doesn't make them a modalist. If they say he is, they are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent. Okay, that there is an economy in the Trinity. Um, is this the way Peter would distinguish between the essence and the person? There's the one and the two. Right. One Three who's, yeah. And that, that's a good way. I forget who used that. Um, you know, someone before him. Uh, uh, but yeah, he does that. Norman Geisler uses that. Craig Brandt from Watchman Fellowship was the first person I heard use it. Yeah. One what? Three who's? Yeah, so, yes? Idolatry. As Christians, we we know who that's referring to, but the Jehovah's Witnesses does have a response to that. And what they do, they play on. Well, they do. Yeah, Erwin Lutzer, he hasn't talked to enough Jehovah's Witnesses because the Jehovah's Witnesses will respond to that and say, "Notice who sits on the throne. Jesus is by the throne, but he don't sit on the throne. He's at the right hand, but he right." Right, so they dodged that one right there. The better way to, to get to the Jehovah's Witnesses is Hebrews 1 and with other passages. We, we see that as clear, but they, they, they play on the word throne. And there, there's, a, there's a better way to get out. Let, let's, uh, let's move on, though, uh, to the next point. Um, some people use... And Jehovah's Witnesses do this, but they're not the only ones. But they will go to Luke chapter 22 and verse 42. And they say, Father, if you, this is during Jesus' time in the Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And they play on this, again, not knowing uh, the nature of Christ, fully God, fully man, and say, 
Well, because there's, you know, wh what is it? If Jesus is God, then can God be schizophrenic? Is he having a battle with his will? If Jesus is God, why is his will different from that of God's will? Well, because in Christ, now this is kind of a controversial one. Out of all of them, this is the most controversial with the Christians. Um, are there one will or are there two wills? Or is there one will or is there, are there two wills with Christ? Here's the point of the matter. If you say that there is one will with Christ, you have a harder time answering this question. Okay? If you say that Jesus has two wills that are somehow united together without confusion or mixture, then you, you don't have a hard time answering this question. There is a way to answer the question. Uh, it, it's difficult. But I hold to the two wills of Christ, and I'm not a heretic. There's a lot of Orthodox Christians who, who hold to that. Um, but that Jesus was fully man. And those who say that Jesus did not have a human will, that his will was only divine, then guess what? That means that at his atonement, when he atoned for the sins of fallen man, he did not atone for my fallen will. That's why Jesus had to be 100% man in his mind, his will, and his emotions. In every aspect, Jesus had to be man. In every way, he took on flesh in every category so that he would redeem me and you, all of his people, totally. Jesus had a human will. Okay? Okay?